European support for improving health and care systems, a Slovenian president's priority. This is a very special set webinar in our series, not only because it's slightly later than the usual time slot, but also because it's under the Slovene presidency. And we will connect today directly to the informal council meeting in Slovenia. The topic today is really relating to what is um, bothering all of us. We need to recover from COVID-19. We need to improve access, quality, sustainability, resilience, but also the governance, of course, because this is a key lever for improving and steering health systems. And the question now, of course, in the context of the Slovene presidency in the council meeting is, what is actually the EU contribution to this? How can the European Union help member states to address all these issues. And you probably know about this, but you will learn in much more detail today during the webinar. There are plenty of instruments for policy support, funding, information, and technical assistance. And we will dive into this today, and we will hear um, about all the different instruments and how they are to be applied and what member states have done so far. As a lineup today, I'm so happy to tell you that we have today with a video message, um, the Minister of Health from Slovenia, Janusz Poknukla. We have as a keynote, my colleague um, from the observatory, Nikola Mauer. Nikola, Nicole Mauer will um, tell us all we need to know about these instruments. And as spotlight speakers, we will have Natasha Atzopardi muskat the uh, director from the WHO Regional Office for Europe. And uh, many people know him very well, Clemens, our special envoy for the Ministry of Health in Austria. But in previous roles, he was a key uh, mover and shaker in Austrian health systems, and he has a lot of experience of using European instruments. And we are also very happy to welcome Christine Berling from the Ministry of Solidarity in Health in France to tell us a little bit about the situation in, in France. And last but not least, I'm happy to uh, welcome my uh, director, Joseph Figueres from the observatory. He will help us wrapping up this session and also reflect a little bit on the discussions during the um, uh, informal council meeting. Just a couple of words on the housekeeping. Please use the chat to um, enter your questions, comments. We will feed this back. Uh, at the end of the session into the, to the panel discussion and the panelists have the opportunity to respond to all your questions. Second, um, we are recording this session and uh, we are also evaluating the session. So um, after the session uh, uh, evaluation form will pop up and you would do us a great favor if you could fill this in, it won't take uh, long. And uh, as I always say, watch out and be tuned in next week, more is uh, coming up. But before we go to our um, uh, ministerial speech, um, I would like to uh, hand over to Slovenia. Dimi, Dimi Pantelli, uh, my colleague from the observatory is there. Dimi, please. Hi, Matthias. I don't know if you can see us yet. Um, very briefly, I am here with Giuseppe Figueres, as you mentioned, and Urska Eklavesh, our colleague from the Ministry of Health here in Slovenia, and we will come back um, later during the session with some reflections from here, while I will also be uh, joining uh, you in bringing in the insights from the chat. But I think uh, over back to Brussels for now, we'll give you more information about what's going on here later on in the session. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you so much. And we are super curious to hear from the informal council meeting and what was, been, what was discussed as far as you can um, uh, tell us or you're allowed to tell us. So this is the moment for the little video coming from the Minister of Health from Slovenia. Annalisa, please. Dear colleagues, thank you for joining us at the launch event of the policy brief on European support for improving health and care systems. I would like to thank the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies for their excellent work in preparing a comparative overview how EU supports member states when strengthening health systems. I would also like to express my gratitude to European Commission for their support and preparation of the brief. One of the priorities of the Slovenian Presidency is to identify opportunities for working together, investing in health and supporting the implementation of innovative solutions for resilient health systems. 
Indeed, strengthening health systems in the face of epidemics and other long-term health threats is also one of the central challenges of the new EU for Health program and the European Health Union. Consequently, more funding was assured in the multi-annual financial framework. The European Commission and the EU member states have always had a strong commitment to protecting health and supporting the strengthening of health systems. Increased funding brings opportunities as well as responsibility to use it in a more strategic and efficient way to contribute to robust health systems and hence to strengthen the European Health Union itself. The EU has developed a wide range of tools and mechanisms for investing in health systems, for developing and implementing health system innovations, and for supporting mutual learning between member states about what works and what doesn't. However, a gap of knowledge how to strategically combine these tools and mechanisms block their uptake. Many member states have expressed the need for additional support in using the resources in a more comparative and strategic way. This gave us a strong message that we need to make a real step forward in establishing additional support services for member states to make best use of existing instruments. The policy brief on European support for improving health and care systems describes the wide range of the EU, EU tools with the potential to support innovation and transformation of health systems. It emphasizes that making best use of EU instruments requires awareness and understanding of many different tools available. The brief brings together evidence to meet the needs of us, policymakers, and health system managers. It presents a lot of complex information in an organized way, which would be otherwise very hard to compare it. We believe that this document will contribute to a better use of all available resources. It will encourage cooperation between member states for strategic and integrated investments in the development of inno innovative solutions while considering the diversity of our health systems and principle of subsidiarity. It is time to invest now, to be able to save in the future. Thank you. And thank you so much to the minister for this wonderful uh, video message. I think it framed beautifully what we want to achieve today um, with this webinar to make a contribution to strengthening the European Health Union to help implement and adopt innovations. And of course, we want to share the knowledge on how best to use all the different instruments. And this is the moment where I would like to hand over to my uh, colleague, Nicole Mauer. Nicole, please give us an overview on the policy brief the minister was talking about. And uh, for all of you uh, watching the webinar at the moment, in a bit, the link to the policy brief will be in the chat. Nicole, please. So also thank you to the minister for setting the scene so beautifully already. Um, today, I will try to give you a very, very quick overview of um, the contents of our newest brief, which was produced together with my colleagues, Nick Fahi and Demi Pantelli at the observatory uh, within the scope of the Slovenian presidency of the Council of the EU. And the title of the brief is European Support for Improving Health and Care Systems. Indeed, the Slovenian presidency has been putting a lot of emphasis on the need for innovative solutions. And we've seen that some countries have been able to respond to the consequences of COVID by implementing such solutions as, for instance, digital health or telemedicine to um, make sure that care is being delivered throughout the pandemic. So the concept of innovation is very central to making our health systems more resilient to face future crises. And not necessarily this means introdu introducing new technologies, but also investing strategically. And this is particularly important to bridge the gap between what we know and in theory works 
um, and what we need to implement in practice, which is still one of the biggest challenges we face. Innovation also means making best use of the tools that we already have. And there is a lot of untapped potential for EU instruments and mechanisms that are already in place. So the Slovenian presidency is committed to making sure that we make best use of these tools and also that we make best use of Europe as um, it provides a lot of natural opportunities for cross-country learning, for mutual support between countries and for exchanging best practices. COVID is not only a challenge, but also a window of opportunity. And um, the new MFF, the multi-annual financial framework shows us because instruments such as EU for Health have been substantially boosted uh, with new funding. And we also have new tools such as the Recovery and Resilience Facility, which can help us um, strengthen health systems. And for this reason, um, the Slovenian presidency asked the European Observatory to produce a mapping of all the different types of tools that are available currently um, to member states to strengthen their health systems. At this point, it's important to mention that although health systems are still primarily the responsibility of member states, the EU is creating an increasingly shared context. So um, in terms of common policy mechanisms, such as the European semester, uh, financial support instruments like the cohesion policy funds or collective actions, um, such as joint actions or expert networks. And therefore, a wide range of different tools has been developing um, over the years, but the challenge is that they have been growing up organically over different policy areas, and it is sometimes quite challenging to identify them and to access them. Access them. And for this reason, um, we need to know what is available, how can we access it? And this is um, one of the primary goals of our policy brief. In order to understand a bit better what these different tools do, we need to look at the processes that they can support us with. Um, and we look at this framework called the process of change, which are the successive steps that lead us towards large scale implementation. And this process usually starts with the formulation of an idea. So an overall policy aim, what do we want to achieve? And can we gain insights from elsewhere, maybe some good practices? We then have to some detailed plans on how to achieve this. So who has to be involved? How do we finance this project? Can we evaluate it over time? And different health systems have different needs. So we also perhaps need to test whether this is going to work. So um, piloting at small scale, um, since we know that plans don't always work out. And then finally, we have the stage of large scale um, system implementation. And as you can see here, this is a very simple overview of the four different stages that I just explained and the different tools that we have identified and how they relate to each of these stages, but also which types of support they can provide. So we have classified them according to these four categories, which are policy, funding, information, and technical assistance. And just a quick note, this is a very simple overview, um, the different tools, overlap over different stages, they also can support more than they can provide more than one type of support. But for the sake of simplicity, here we have mapped them according to their main contribution. Now I will give you a very quick run through the four different types of support just to give you an idea of what we mean um, by this and what the different tools are. Um, starting with policy, this is usually the formulation of statements or Guide, guidance or some kind of direction, giving member states um, an idea of what has to happen and bringing member states together um, on a common path. Um, the first tool that I want to mention is the European semester, which um, helps member states plan and coordinate their fiscal policies, but over the years has become increasingly important for health as well. And just last year, all of the member states received recommendations on how to improve their health systems within the semester. Then we also have count, uh, council recommendations and conclusions, um, commission communications. And these have been particularly important in areas such as cancer, digital health, and most recently, cross-border health threats and preparedness and response in mobilizing a wide range of actors and, pro and projects at EU level. Type of support is funding, which is pretty straightforward. Um, 
providing financing for infrastructure, but this can also include um, training people or buying medical equipment. Um, and this ranges from the cohesion funds, which are particularly useful for countries that are still facing regional disparities to um, the loans that can be provided by the European Investment Bank, um, which in the past have been funding large infrastructure pro uh, projects primarily but in recent years have also been starting to support primary healthcare projects and smaller infrastructure projects. Finally, I want to mention the Recovery and Resilience Facility, which is the newest um, EU tool in that sense. Um, and it is particularly shaped by national plans. So what countries are wanting to boost in recovery of COVID. Um, but many countries have included health in their plans. And we see that, for example, in Germany and France, who are um, investing billions in modernizing and digitalizing their infrastructure, but also Italy and Austria who are focusing on primary health care and territorial medicine. Then we summarize a very wide range of different activities under the term information, and this includes um, cross-country evidence, collecting data to compare the health status in different countries, uh, models for implementation, research projects, and even expert networks. And these range across um, the EU for Health program to the research program, which is Horizon Europe, and also the support provided by EU agencies such as ECDC and EMA. And at this stage, I want to say EU for Health is the only um, program which is specifically de dedicated to health. Um, and it has been substantially boosted um, in the new MFF. So this is a very positive news for health systems. Then we pass to technical assistance. This is a type of support that goes one step further from information, and it means adapting support to national context. Um, very notable tool here is the technical support instrument, which is the successor to the structural reform support service at DG Reform. And it is the only tool which supports countries um, across all stages of the process of change. And we also have the Invest EU Advisory Hub. This is a collaboration between the EIB and the European Commission, and it helps countries to develop investment plans, um, decide how they can use different um, funds, combine them for an investment project. But at this stage, we need to um, consider that both of these technical assistance um, programs are not specialized on health systems. And this is also this concept of having um, very little specific support for health systems is also emphasized in the funding. If we have a look at the comparative sizes of different EU funding instruments, we can see that EU for Health um, is very small compared to the others. And this gives us two main messages. First, that policymakers wanting to um, implement reforms in the health system have to go beyond just the tools dedicated to health. And they have to combine several different tools which have different priorities. And to summarize, um, as I said, maximizing EU support requires combining different tools. And the EU has many tools as we've seen that can support health systems, but most of them do not have health as their primary priority. And this creates challenges of aligning the different objectives of the different tools with the objectives um, of health systems and their needs as well. Um, as we've said several times, health systems um, function in different ways and they may have different interests, but also different potential to receive funding. So there really is um, a need to help policymakers um, in identifying and combining tools in a more transparent and intuitive way. We've seen in the primary healthcare reform in Austria, for instance, they have managed to combine several different types of tools um, to implement their reform. And I'm sure we will hear more during the panel discussion about this. And you can also read the policy brief for the full case study that we have written about um, this reform. But in many cases, this is rather a coincidence uh, and not a systemic, a systematic process that countries can access. There is also scope for wider collaboration between different member states and also to involve other actors such as the World Health Organization and we wrote another case study in the brief um, to 
illustrate how the WHO has supported together with the EU the um, health system reforms in Greece um, after uh, the global financial crisis. And so the big question is how can countries uh, facing common issues reach out to collaborate and work together and is there, can we find a way um, to facilitate this? And I can see Matthias, so I'm going to wrap up. Thank you very much. Um, make sure to follow us on Twitter and to read the full policy brief on our website. Thank you. Nicole, thank you so much for this fantastic overview and also quite amazing to see all these instruments and tools available from idea to implementation, from policy uh, to technical um, assistance, you know, and as you have pointed out rightly, you know, we need to make an effort actually to make the most of the available instrument and to see what suits um, best. We have uh, the next speaker, and I hope she has managed to um, uh, come on board at the moment, um, Natasha Atzopardi Muscat from the WHO Regional Office in uh, Copenhagen. And after Natasha's um, quick um, intervention, we have a slight change in the program because of things are happening in Slovenia, of course. But Natasha, first um, uh, to you, I mean, this is your bread and butter business, um, helping countries transforming their health systems. Please reflect a little bit on, on all these tools uh, which the European Union is providing. Thank you very much, Matthias. And it's always a pleasure um, indeed to be speaking about this topic. I like to look back a few years when we were concerned that actually the EU was scaling back um, from its support to health and, and health systems. And the fact, of course, because of the COVID pandemic, what we have seen now is an unprecedented level of support from the European Union. And for us as the WHO Regional Office for Europe, this is indeed very, very heartening. What are we doing? We are working with many different partners within the European Commission, not only with DG Santé, but also with DG NIR and DG IMPA. And I think the way you have mapped up the overview is really um, impressive because far too often people do not realize how much the EU is actually doing for investment in health, not only within EU countries, but also in the neighborhood countries. And I think that uh, um, uh, the case study in the brief around the, um, the work that WHO did um, with the EU support in Greece at the time of the crisis has really taught us many lessons that we can bring to bear now as countries have really um, gone uh, quite big in terms of their requests also for support and funding, even um, from the Recovery and Resilience Fund. So I think my plea over here is to recognize that WHO through um, our country offices in many countries in the region, but also where we do not have a physical presence, we are still very well linked in, of course, through ministries of health and through other partners, including WHO collaborating centers where we can bring in from our perspective, because we are continuously working with countries, that support, particularly, I think the areas that we are seeing as a priority going forward are the following. Primary healthcare, many countries are looking to strengthen their primary healthcare. And I think that the document that the countries, the 53 member states adopted at the regional committee um, just a few weeks ago, provides a blueprint that we can use when the EU is actually guiding countries um, on transformation and support on the ground. A second area is in the area of mental health. Many countries have now really um, awoken to the need to transform their mental health services, which were already not meeting needs and demands pre-pandemic, and the gap between supply and demand has become very, very stark indeed. And over here, we hope really to set out an ambitious program of work, even through support um, uh, through the EU for Health program to ensure that countries can invest in mental health. We see a renewed interest in hospitals. Many countries are taking the opportunity to invest or renew their hospital infrastructure. And here I would like to mention the work that actually we will be uh, embarking on also in collaboration with the European Observatory 
to really rethink what should be the priorities when we are investing in hospitals in the European region or renewing hospitals uh, in the light of the lessons that we have learned from COVID in terms of the digital transformation, in terms of the environmental footprint. And this brings me to another area, which is digital health. Digital health is one of the flagship areas that we are um, uh, promoting as WHO Regional Office for Europe. Digital health, investment in digital health is a key priority for the European Union. There is money available. I think what is really critical is to make sure that we do have a strong health systems perspective, public health perspective guiding the investment so that we make sure that the money that is being spent on digital technologies really enables health systems transformation and is investment in digital with a purpose. So I think, Matthias, plenty of work to be done. The instruments are there. Let us uh, continue, as many countries are doing, to bring the WHO Office for Europe in the conversation early on as a trusted partner where we can provide technical assistance and support to make sure that the investments that are being supported by the European Union really go towards achieving the objectives that we want to achieve and also um, jointly convening countries together that are working on specific areas because of the opportunity to learn through implementation together because a lot of the difficulty lies in the implementation process and I think um, getting those countries as Slovenia really has put on the agenda the need to to work more closely together, even when we are implementing health systems transformation, uh, not only because of the exchange of experience, but also sometimes because of the mutual support that can be obtained in a safe space with countries um, implementing transformation together. So I hope that at least that gives you a bit our perspective as the WHO Regional Office for Europe, and I'm really sorry that I'm going to have to jump off to join another meeting. Thank you. Natasha, thank you so much for spending your precious time with us. And also thank you so much for these very clear messages. I take it from you that uh, WHO's um, infrastructure, you mentioned the country offices, its um, country knowledge and its technical expertise makes it actually an ideal partner for uh, member states and the European Union to work together on health system transformation and tackle all the challenges you mentioned, digital, COVID, and also hospitals you, you just mentioned very briefly. So thank you so much. And thank you for uh, being with us, even though you have to go now. Bye bye. Take care. So and this is a little bit of a derogation from our program. Um, I am going now to hand back to Slovenia. Dimi, please. Hello, Brussels. Good afternoon from Slovenia. We are here in this beautiful area of Bordeaux, where the informal meeting of the health ministers is taking place uh, under the Slovenian presidency of the Council of the European Union. So we had the opportunity today actually to talk about this work that we're talking about with you. Um, and I think just fair to say, you can see probably from the background, we are in the very official room of the meeting for now. Um, everybody else has gone to lunch. We don't stop working. We stayed here um, to be with you in, in Brussels and in the ether um, and talk about our policy brief. Before uh, passing on to Josep uh, Figueres, who is here uh, for a short reflection, I would like to uh, invite our colleague from the Ministry of Health in Slovenia, Urska Erklavec. Urska has been a very close collaborator throughout the presidency and has uh, been a real miracle worker on many levels uh, to give us a short uh, perspective from the Slovenian side of things. Urska, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Dimi. Warm greetings also uh, from Slovenia on my, on my behalf. We are very happy to be able to have um, and to merge this webinar on the policy brief together with the informal meeting of health ministers. Um, I would just like to shortly say that in the past days, we have already received many positive responses on the brief, uh, indicating um, that the brief will be a very useful resource for member states. And while saying that, I would um, like to thank the observatory for their great work and their expert support also today here in Slovenia. Back to observatory. 
Thank you very much. Urska, it takes the camera a little moment to glide over to the person who has the activated microphone. So I would like to ask our director, Josep Figueres, to activate his microphone. I'll switch off mine and then he'll give us a, a short glimpse of what's been going on. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, what a pleasure to join uh, our colleagues in Brussels and elsewhere today uh, from Slovenia. Uh, very briefly, uh, very briefly, Matthias and colleagues, uh, today we had the opportunity to present a brief to the ministers in the informal council. Clearly and unfortunately, we cannot go into any of their responses or their views, uh, uh, in particular towards the possible council conclusions. But I think it's fair and appropriate to say, I checked with the Slovenian presidency that there's been a, a very broad support, both on the topic, member states are struggling uh, to uh, share, learn from each other, to implement new innovations to strengthen health systems. So there is a lot of welcome towards instruments and waste exchange practices across. So um, second, we can say as well, beyond uh, discussions today and referring back to the conference, the Slovenian conference on the same topic that took place in July and we had the opportunity to participate, there is a clear convergence in terms of the priorities. Priorities to tackle across Europe, the digital would be the usual suspect, cancer information systems, health promotion and public health, but also the priorities that member states are pursuing in their individual countries, which are very well reflected, as uh, we heard from Nicole, in the kinds of plans they're putting forward uh, for the recovery and resilience facility, uh, uh, strengthening hospital infrastructures, but strengthening primary care, integrating with primary care and social services, integrating services, lots of support as well for training and a skill mix development. So clearly, based on the prior conference, there is a convergence on national and European priorities and therefore the appetite to find ways to learn across each other. And this is the debate they had ministers today about the best strategies and mechanisms and tools and how to use those existing tools to work together. Again, lots of positive feedback we heard from, from the ministers today. I want to finish perhaps with one final reflection, Matthias, if I may. The issue of subsidiarity, not coming from the ministers, but from myself, our own reflections in the observatory, clearly all these tools are very much within the principle of subsidiarity, the principle that member states have the primary responsibility for health systems. However, I would say, I would argue, and many of you would agree, that there are common health systems values and there are common challenges that while respecting subsidiarity need to look, be looked across uh, European member states of the WHO region, as well, of course, the European Union and member states. Uh, a reminder, colleagues, not only viruses cross borders. COVID was just one health system shock. There have been others, like the financial crisis that cross borders, like the refugee crisis that cross borders, and many other that are coming. So this concept of EU uh, and indeed broader European public goods governance is fundamental to tackle, to strengthen the resilience across systems in so many areas, like I said already, digital health, workforce, and many others that would require this element of public goods, European broad governance. And indeed, again, and wrapping up a bit what's been said already, uh, how we learn from each other on implementing those innovations, innovations that, as I said, they are shared across member states. Thank you, Matthias and colleague. Joseph, Back thank you so much for Brussels. sharing with all necessary discretion your insights from the uh, informal council meeting and also a little bit on the atmospheric and for your uh, personal assessment of questions of um, uh, learning from each other. And I think it's extremely encouraging that we hear today that ministers are talking about piece of evidence and discussing how can we better share knowledge, information and evidence in the future. Now it's my great pleasure to invite uh, Clemens Auer as um, the spotlight speaker from Austria. Clemens is a seasoned policy maker who has already started to transform health systems and he has also a lot of experience using those instruments. Clemens, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Matthias. <clears throat> Thank you for the nice setup. Um, um, it's a pleasure for me to join this webinar here. 
yes, indeed, you know, if you have a problem, you have to solve it. And one of the problems, the Austrian health system, which per se is a very well developed health system of a high income country, but still it has problems. And the major problem is if you look very carefully when it comes to health services, it's the weakness of primary health care. And, uh, you know, during many years now, I always have looked at European advice and European tools to reform that and to transform the primary, the current primary health care system into a better future. You know, that started with, uh, with uh, policy dialogues we had with the observatory very early on to bring everyone, the, uh, the stakeholders and shareholders in this problem uh, at the same level. You know, we had to convince the doctors association, we had to convince the social health insurances and all the other players, you know, that we do have a problem. So we had to make them aware. But then, you know, during the, the, the process of, of changing us as a regulatory framework, we use quite a bit of help of the, of the, uh, of the, of the observatory. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to 2017, then finally we were able to pass in parliament a new regulation when it comes to primary health care. But this is one side. Then the implementation, and I think Natasha pointed out very, very uh, uh, pointedly that, you know, we have to concentrate also on implementation of these reforms. And then once again, we used in Austria quite a bit uh, tools which were provided by the European Commission. One was, you know, that we organized a startup service for these new primary healthcare centers and uh, entities we wanted to create. And with, with, with the back then uh, tier of funding, you know, so that we had the technical instruments also for, you know, for the concrete person, for the medical doctor, for the team around the medical doctor, if she or he wants, wanted to organize them, a, a new facility, a new service, so to say, a startup service, really in the best way of um, what we can say is startup service. We also used the funding new instruments the European Investment Bank uh, is offering us, you know, the member states, you know, the Euro European Investment Bank is our bank, the bank of member states, so we should utilize the funds we can get from there. So we, with them, we organized the 300 million euro loan program for an investment, infrastructure investment for primary healthcare units, uh, so that there, so there's no excuse that there's no money, money available, so it's very ch cheap loans, very you know, even if the uh, general loan market is very low, but still, you know, you can um, offer cheap money to, for, for investment. And the latest is that out of the RRF, so the recovery and, 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 and resilient fund, we also will invest um, out for the, the, for the Austrian piece of cake, you know, a hundred million euros in grants for investment into primary healthcare infrastructure. So this should give you the example that if, you, if you're clever and if you're wise and use European tools, because it, it, you know, we as ministers of health are not sometimes not the strongest at the cabinet table of the government. So we have to look around, you know, where can we get support? Where can we get some funding? And um, I definitely was very happy and successful in, in creating this support and, and getting it from the European uh, um, Commission, for example, or the European Investment Bank. And that was very, very helpful. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you so much, um, Clemens. When you were talking about the primary care reforms in Austria, you have um, introduced and pushed forward. I was just thinking about uh, Nicole's presentation and the policy sequence she was talking about ideas, plans, tests, implementation. And actually, you always had your hands in the toolbox of the European Commission um, looking for some help and what was available and very skillfully. And I think in a way, Austria is actually the poster child of using these instruments. <laughs> so thank you so much. And uh, that is um, the opportunity now to um, welcome our third spotlight um, speaker from uh, France. I would now like to hand over to Christine Berling. Please, Christine. Thank you. And thank you very much, Limitas, for, for giving me the floor. And of course, I mean, thank you for the Slovenian presidency for this kind invitation to speak today. I'm most appreciative of this opportunity. 
Uh, so the question uh, is how this resonates, I mean, with the French upcoming presidency, and I will try I mean, to answer it. Even so, we're still waiting for, um, for arbitrage, and I won't be able, I mean, to go into too many details, and please, I mean, um, excuse me in advance. Uh, so I, I really love this policy brief, because I think it, it really underlines beautifully the wealth of tools that we have collectively built over the years I mean, to strengthen our union. And of course, I mean, when you show them the size of the, of the health area, this, this is still very small, but it's expanded. And, and I think the, the crisis has been an opportunity to use all these available tools in an unprecedented way and also to show where the gaps were. And then the commission act very quickly, I mean, to, an, to, to propose an ambitious package to address the air security issues. And of course, I mean, the French presidency intends to build on this momentum. And what I can say today, um, and what is at the core of the French presidency, will be to strive towards more coherence and cohesiveness to bridge the critical disconnect that we have between national and European public health policy, and really to build a common narrative for a health union that would go beyond the health security. And of course, I mean, France, together with the Czech Republic and Sweden, will continue the significant work on the previous three and improve the resilience of the health system in Europe. This is key priority, and we don't intend to lose them in this important goal. But there are many um, other areas where we believe, I mean, stronger cooperation within the EU can bring clear benefit to member states and citizens. And these are include, I mean, cancer, antimicrobial resistance, rare disease, health data, and global health. Very quickly, in the area of cancer, what we will take this opportunity of the World Cancer Day um, that will take place at the beginning of our presidency to discuss important steps of the Europe beating cancer plan, and probably focusing on, on pediatric cancer. Uh, but I, I would just want to say also that we appreciate the continuous I mean, Slovenian leadership in this area um, since the previous presidency in 2008. Um, in entry, microbial resistance um, and in furtherance of the joint action, uh, which concluded this year and has achieved I mean, its objective and federated the European stakeholders, we, we we will, I mean, organize a ministerial conference to renew this antimicrobial resistance collaborative and dangerous uh, in a one health perspective. Um, rare disease, we will call for greater cross-border collaboration and for a new comprehensive policy plan. The purpose here really is to drive change in area of patient needs innovation access to medicine. Digital health has been mentioned uh, by one of the speakers today. Um, and it's, we, we, we will try to address uh, what we think are the prerequisite for um, a European consistent approach towards health data use, ethics, security, as part of the European sovereignty in digital health. And to finish, uh, uh, but it's an important area where we will work and build on the, uh, on the work of the previous presidency is global health. Um, yes, I will finish. <laughs> um, global health it is very important because we've seen the union stepping in during the COVID pandemic. And, and we think it's very important to propose a common narrative to assert I mean, the EU as a major political actor in global health. Just um, to conclude, and, and, and I need to conclude because um, I, I 
just want to recall that the, the, the current crisis has brought into sharp relief the need to understand the complexity of the drivers of human health. And we need to act accordingly with this one else approach. Um, and, and we have all the tools, I mean, at European level, and, and this, um, this conference is showing you what the wealth of tools that we have. So we need to really act and grasp those tools to act boldly to build the health union um, that, um, that the European citizens are calling currently. And, um, and just a last sentence just to, to share my deep appreciation for the Slovenian dynamic presidency and for bringing forward them in this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christine. Thank you so much for this wonderful um, outlook, actually, for the French um, uh, upcoming presidency. And um, there were plenty of things in it. And I just uh, scribbled down like coherence and cohesiveness. Uh, we've seen all the instruments for different phases. Uh, how do um, countries manage actually to use them? You were talking about a common narrative for the health, uh, for the European Health Union. And um, you were also mentioning a one health approach uh, with regards to AMR, but many, many um, other things. And um, last but not least, um, you were talking about global health and the role that Europe actually has in, in, in global health and that we need to assume this and uh, really act on it. Thank you so much. And this is the moment where I would like to ask my colleague Dimi to tell us a little bit about what she has been monitoring in the chat box. Timmy, are you there? Please speak us, join us with your videos on. So you see a much less formal uh, surroundings than just earlier. Um, this is because the delegations are coming back from lunch and they're going to the final formal session so we cannot be sitting in their seats. Um, Matthias, there is not a, a lot to monitor from the chat because there is no activity at the moment, but uh, I don't at least see any of our participants having asked open questions to the speakers or commented based on the country's experience. We did receive some uh, questions um, uh, per email in advance of the webinar. Those were linked to, for example, the criteria that the European Union can leverage for countries to receive support and I think part of what we do in the in the policy brief that Nicole was talking about earlier is we also showcase that perhaps also these different sets of criteria or different mechanisms to approach these tools is what add, what add a layer of complexity to member states actually approaching them so I think I don't think it is uh, the moment perhaps we need another three four webinars with uh, a group of uh, participants to actually discuss this how prescriptive the EU should be as Giuseppe uh, mentioned um, Earlier, this issue of uh, solidarity and also uh, subsidiarity on the other side um, and who decides what is quite a hot issue uh, in discussions. We saw that um, during the ministerial conference in July. Um, so I think th there is room to reflect going forward and also moving from the Slovenian presidency to the French presidency of how we do these things exactly and what the rules of the, of the game are, are specifically. Um, but let's, uh, let's plan a couple of more webinars uh, to tackle that more more in detail, Matthias. Um, there is a question I see now uh, that we received, additional one, which is about mapping um, the areas different countries are prioritizing and investing in post-COVID. And I think what we have a bit of in the brief, uh, and Nicole will correct me um, if I'm wrong, is the recovery and resilience plans, um, a little bit of a, a cross-sectional view. And I think this is probably to our participants who asked this, uh, one of the first places to look. So these this, uh, plans, um, we can take a look at uh, to have a feeling about that, but I'm sure we'll be talking about that quite a bit um, in the next few months. So we'll get so a better, better even, uh, even impression. So you, you said there are not uh, many questions in the chat box. These are quite fundamental questions. I jot down the criteria to get access and link to the criteria, I think, are also the program cycle because they can also be quite uh, complex. You were talking about the balance between solidarity and subsidiarity. You were uh, talking about mapping investing for COVID recovery. And uh, well, that's already quite something. And um, please don't try to answer all this question. Um, just pick the one out you feel best suited to, to respond. And Nicole, can we start with you? Yes, thank you for those questions. Um, I think I can only echo what Demi was saying that if you have a look at um, our brief, there is a lot of detail about how these different tools are accessed and what the criteria are for applying for these tools. And indeed, it is 
um, very complex because you have to be uh, aware of what different direct directive generals, so different DGs within the commission ask from you, um, what the timings are, as you mentioned, um, these programs run over seven years. So you need to make sure that you apply at the right time and that you um, submit the right um, documentation and that you, when you wanna combine different tools, you do this um, in a way that works. So I think I can say that and regarding the COVID um, the tools that are being used um, to recover from COVID, the recovery and resilience facilities um, are the main um, new tool that we have now and, and a very large source of funding. And if you have a look at the commission website, you can also see um, how the different countries are implementing this in their um, national plans. But also the other tools are very much adapting um, after COVID has struck uh, EU for Health for instance, is now 5 billion. Before that, it was 450 million euros. And um, so there is a lot of scope uh, specifically for things like One Health, for things like preparedness and, and response um, that are being boosted uh, significantly. So that's also something that you will find in the brief. Thank you. Excellent, uh, Nicole. And I think that's another little delve into the uh, policy briefs uh, contents. Claimants, please. Yeah, I think, you know, um, I think, and uh, what I really like what, with this initiative of, uh, from the Slovenian presidency is that we don't have to invent these wheels over the new, you know, this is very much um, uh, annoying for us. And, and I think in a comprehensive, um, to find a comprehensive toolbox is very helpful for each and every one in, of us in the capitals, because, you know, it's not very, easy and we've mentioned already you know and i don't want to repeat that to to find the right tools etc cetera, etc cetera. and you know you have to prove of course you know the, the efficiency of what you want to do and uh, and i think um, uh, we had it very easy you know to, just to, to to exemplify it a little bit for the colleagues and maybe in the member states you know when we when we came to the european investment bank to ask them for money you know these these guys are Bankers, you know, they want to, they want to have clear facts at the table. And it took quite a while that we understood each other because you know ministers of health speak a different language than bankers and vice versa. So it was very interesting this experience. But in the end, you know, they need clarity and they need insurance that that, that the money invested is 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 well invested. And you know, the good thing is that we had already a new regulatory framework. So that, of course reassured them that we do know what we do that what we want to do and what we want to achieve but you know these kind of things you know is is you know it's a learning process for for both sides for the investors or for the people who give you loans and for in that particular instance and for us because once again you know we sometimes diff speak different languages but uh, you can overcome the hurdles and barriers and learn lemons Thank you so much. And I think these are very important uh, lessons from Austria and from the past you have been following. And thank you so much for sharing this and uh, not getting tired of uh, sharing this with uh, different audiences. Christine, please. Um, I don't have to say much, but um, just to understand that, I mean, you have both tools to collaborate I mean, across countries. And this is very important because this is how we build them in Europe. And we have tools that help you with your own systems and for strengthening the implementation. And it's not that complex. So I might come from a, a different point of view because I've been there for longer periods than uh, other people. But um, you, it, it's very simple. There's schools for proposals and then the, 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 the rules are there and it's been there for many years. So we don't reinvent this. And but the, the, the complementarity of both those tools, very important for member states. And my team will have a portfolio of, of joint actions and other I mean, uh, the tools that we do implement. And that is really helpful for France own planification in France. Christine, thank you so much. And I think this was again a very important message and probably also a political message when you said. These are tools 
which help you with your own system. So there's not a European fantasy behind it, like uh, there's one health system, it's your system and you can retain your system, but you can uh, receive some help. Dimi, do we have, uh, we, we have time for a very, very quick uh, second round. Do we have something new in the chat box? Well, we do have something new in the chat box, but I don't know that we have a time for uh, responses because this, these are actually deep questions that we have oh, that yeah. we have in the in the chat exactly that we have in the chat box at the moment. So one of those is about European support beyond EU countries, so countries in the European okay. region, but not for the EU. And I think we need to plan another policy brief on that uh, as well. Um, and then we have two questions about how competitive uh, accessing these tools actually are. So is this about finding um, the best possible successful approach to get the money or is it more like there is a, a fundamental um, intention to disperse and you just need to have a good plan and, uh, and uh, let's say a, a valuable goal uh, linked to that. Um, and the other, the final one is a link between the duration of the financing program, which is seven years, and the difficulty of changing political cycles within member states and what we do when there is a, an ongoing project and then there is political change that means a disruption at the national level. So as you see, um very interesting <laughs> very interesting quite daunting but doable question. daunting but doable nicole mm -hmm. very quickly okay this is very challenging i don't know how to respond but um i think i can also get back to to the questions uh in in, in written form later on well what i want to say about the first one um concerning support beyond um eu countries uh, there is a lot of ongoing support, but very similarly to uh, as we see it in the internal context, this can be quite fragmented and different um, and difficult to identify. So we have the neighborhood policy, for instance, for, especially for countries that are um, close to um, the European Union. And um, as in the question they were asking about um, countries in the WHO Euro region, there are a lot of initiatives uh, that the EU is um, conducting jointly with the WHO there as well. But um, yes, as Demi said, I think we're planning to um, also explore that more um, on a wider scale and maybe in a new policy brief. Thank you. Christine, please. Okay, very quickly about the competition. I mean, the, the policy tools are non-competitive because um, um, it's, it's a process where we design collectively the field and the area where we want to, 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 to work collectively. And then the other tools I, I was mentioning and helping you straight into your own national, uh, to strengthen your own national system. This one is linked with the European semester. So it's very easy because in the European semester, you have identified where you want to work. And those tools, of course, I mean, you do a proposal, you justify the proposal, you build something coherent, et cetera. But th this, this is all linked. So, it shouldn't be seen as some black box, very complex. It's just very easy just to pick up the tools that you need at a certain point. At least this is my view. Christine, thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we have lost uh, Clemens. His uh, picture got frozen and then he disappeared altogether. Just let me wrap up three points I, I jotted down. First of all, I, see, I think we've seen here today a kind of very practical approach to advance a European health union. So it's really about solving problems, you know, not preaching European integration, but really addressing issues where the European Union can add value. And also in collaboration with WHO, as we heard about the infrastructure, the technical expertise and the country knowledge. Second is we've seen a huge arsenal, a huge toolbox of tools for almost any phase of policy making. And of course, there are complexities around it. Nicole was uh, referring to it and we heard a bit about it in the, in the um, uh, discussion, but also we heard from um, claimants that Austria was actually quite um, able to make use out of them despite all the complexities. And he was already giving away a couple of tricks. And finally, I would like to get back to the observations uh, from uh, Joseph from the informal council meeting in uh, Slovenia. First of all, he reported that there was great interest actually in this policy brief and the tools and that it was very welcome and um, that there was a constructive discussion. And I thought this was super, super um, encouraging, not only with regards to advancing a European health union, but also with regards to knowledge transfer 
in our region, you know, that science, scientific research, uh, results, mapping exercises, toolboxes are taken serious, considered and discussed. And that's it for today. Please tune in next week. We will talk about regulating the unknown, uh, unknown. genomics will be the topics. Bye bye. Take care. Mm -hmm.